Hi, welcome back to EMC 640, Quality Improvement in EMS. Upon completion of this lecture, students should appreciate the unique legal dilemmas related to clinical and non-clinical quality improvement. They should also be familiar with the concept of medical peer review, and they should appreciate the limitations of the text discussion of legal aspects of quality. There are two key legal issues that are of concern to quality improvement individuals. First is the extent to which information can be kept confidential. And the second is the extent that those people involved or those individuals involved in quality assurance or quality improvement are legally liable for malpractice. Well, when I discuss the limitations, the text looks strictly at quality as being a clinical issue, which we've discussed in almost every lecture, that not being the case. As we've discussed over and over, there's multiple aspects of operations that may, may be better handled by operational-oriented individuals as opposed to clinical individuals. And those, however, those clinical or those non-clinical operation issues, such as response time, may carry a heavy impact on clinical care. So it's important that we don't simply look at clinical care and that we create quality improvement mechanisms that are much larger in context than simply clinical care that are run by the clinician side of the EMS organization. There's also this issue of research versus quality that arises quite often. The question is, is a project research oriented or is it a quality improvement project? And there's really no clear cut answer to the question. There's lots of areas of gray. If you hope to publish the results of a project that is aimed at improving something in the organization, then quite often you'll need institutional uh, review board approval to actually carry out a project if it's, if it's done under the auspices of research. However, as we've discussed before, if we think about quality improvement, quality improvement is in essence no more than doing research in the system, changing pieces of the process to see if you improve something. Both are based on the empirical improvement uh, or research model, um, the way of thinking about creating a hypothesis, testing that hypothesis, determining what works, and going through that cycle again. So the question becomes in an organization, is it research or quality? And the only way to determine that is on a case-by-case -case basis. Let me give you a quick example. If you're working in an organization and you decide that um, you, you notice some performance standards in another organization where they're actually ventilating patients differently. If you look at the standard of care, the standard of care historically for ventilating patients, and for instance, cardiac arrest, has been to ventilate them rapidly, 24 times a minute. However, if you look at the standard of care in the context of protocols or procedures, it often simply says ventilate the patient. Actually, if you look historically at advanced cardiac life support textbooks, it would simply say ventilate the patient. So it didn't give you a rate, it didn't give you a depth, it didn't tell you how to squeeze the bag. We know today that those are very important concepts. So if you undertake a project to improve that in an organization, is that research or is that quality improvement? Very difficult question sometimes. And it's very important for you to give a lot of thought, especially when you're thinking about clinical improvements and whether it needs to go to an institutional review board to be considered an ethical change to the process. Also, it arises from the research side that sometimes we have to make changes without consent, informed consent of individuals, to actually see if something works. So there are actual paths to bypass informed consent initially to actually make major strides in things like fluid resuscitation or cardiac resuscitation uh, changes. Well, when we talked about the first issue and the issue around, you know, what information is protected, we're really switching gears. And instead of thinking about things from an improvement perspective, we're taking a defensive stance and looking at it from a risk management perspective. 
in some organizations, they'll have actually both departments. Many hospitals have a risk management department and a quality department. Sometimes they're actually under the same individual. However, their operations are completely different. In such departments or in such organizations, quite often they actually don't want each other to know what's going on. Uh, from the risk management perspective, they don't want the quality side to know about legal cases because it means that they've actually potentially breached the confidentiality issue and more people know about it. From the quality side, we need to know about it because it's the only way we can make improvements to improve the larger system, which provides care to more patients. So there's this huge issue related to confidentiality. Well, there's also been statutes formed to try to dictate what would take place from a, from a concept of confidentiality and, and coverage from liability and discoverability, if you will, uh, whether information can be brought into court. Those become issues that you really should think through when developing a clinical aspect to your quality improvement plan. Discoverability can be very important. The question might arise, we have a patient, you have a particular malpractice case. The patient was inappropriately intubated. There was an esophageal intubation. There's a lawsuit been filed related to that. Can the um, attorney that's actually prosecuting the, the case, can they actually come to the system and through discovery subpoena all the information about historical performance related to endotracheal innovation success. If they can show that historically it's low, then they've potentially just expanded their lawsuit. So now it's not the individual that performed it incorrectly. Now it's the system. And it can't go beyond the system. Maybe it's the system and even to a higher stance, um, the community, because the community has a responsibility to make sure that the quality measures are in place to actually carry out process improvement. So you can see there's a lot of legal issues that can fall in the midst of thinking about quality improvement. Coverage from liabilities, we said, is also an issue. If, as an organization, you know that the performance is really low for something like endotracheal innovation success, the question becomes, as administrators in that system, are you liable? Is the organization liable for performance or something going wrong at that, at that juncture? Um, you know, I've seen this in, in the hospital situation where uh, the, the situation existed that the hospital as a whole knew that transfusion of blood was not being carried out correctly. That knowledge existed. A situation arose where an individual received the wrong blood in a hospital. Luckily, it wasn't something that caused a reaction and there wasn't a, a real adverse effect. But in that situation, the question arises, was it the individual that administered the wrong blood that was liable or was it the system that was liable because they knew that the process was flawed? So you can see from a, a coverage perspective, we have to think beyond just the individuals and think deeper. Now, the, the reverse side of this, this issue is that sometimes organizations look at it and they try to dump all of the liability back on the individual. But that's actually contrary to everything we've talked about with Deming's um, stance that 95% of problems are system problems and only 5% are people problems. And if we look deeply at, at data, we can actually prove that over and over and over related to various type of performance indicators and systems. So there's got to be a blend. There's got to be a, a procedure for the way you think about clinical, legal, risk management, management issues. But of course, being a process oriented individual, my bias is that that department should fall underneath the, clin uh, the quality improvement department or the quality individual that's working on improving the whole performance of the system. But again, I bring you back to the context of the text, and it limits that discussion simply to clinical issues, and that's not always the case. Now, there have been statutes passed 
to try to limit that discoverability. In North Carolina, for example, General Statute 131E-155 and the definitions under Article 7, it actually outlines something. Um, the definition for an emergency medical services peer review committee. The reason for this terminology, peer review committee, is because historically in hospitals, the peer review committee has some coverage or some exception from liability. However, I have to tell you from working on the hospital side that that's not always um, a done deal. Um, it doesn't always hold up. There's still discoverability issues. And it really is a case-by-case -case basis. And for things like EMS, this hasn't been challenged. So even though you think you have this level of protection, the reality is because there's no uh, precedent for what would happen in court, it's very possible that an attorney could get the judge to actually order you to turn over records. So even though this is in place, however, it's a deterrent. It's a deterrent to try to go in that direction. But in a hospital, every case that comes under scrutiny where there may be a liable issue is immediately put under the context of a lawyer. And by doing that, it actually it actually gains um, uh, that protection as part of the um, the legal um, uh, oversight uh, relationship to an attorney because the attorney has that privilege to information from the client without having to be able to divulge that. So that is withstanding. So like a, again, I say in a hospital, it immediately, if there's an issue, it, it's an attorney is contacted and a record started as part of the risk management process to provide that level of protection. Often we don't think about that in EMS. The other issues that make it very difficult in EMS is the level of authority and the chain of command, if you will, or uh, the, the, the referred practice um, where paramedics are actually carrying out actions under the license of a given physician. Well, that should provide some degree of latitude and protection. However, there have been cases, and in particular, there was one case um, in North Carolina of, of recent where an individual was pronounced dead on the scene by a paramedic. Well, it turned out that the individual wasn't dead and, and as they unsipped the body bag at the morgue, the patient's still alive. Even though the physician was on site, the individual paramedic was, was uh, even though the medical examiner, I should say, was on site, the paramedic was still the one that received the most heat and lost their job in the situation. They're still the one that the state as a whole took action against to actually suspend their credentials and not allow them to practice. Now, the question also at that point becomes, was the medical director of that system the one that was ultimately liable or was it that individual? So you can see it's a very sticky issue when you start thinking about, you know, the legal aspects of, of quality of care. Well, the idea with this committee is to put it under that context. But again, it only relates to the clinical aspect of operations of an organization. So we're leaving the other aspects out. And we know from a system dynamics or systems theory perspective that if we only look at one component, you know, we're looking at cardiac arrest survival, we may not, we might not notice the impact that our poor fleet maintenance is actually making on our ability to get to calls to resuscitate patients. Well, General Statute 143.518 actually talks about confidentiality of patients, and I'll actually post links to these in WebCat so that you can actually read the entireties. I've, I've just poured out portions here, but this actually discusses the confidentiality of patient information and who may have access. And um, for the most part, with uh, HIPAA regulations, most state statutes at this point only allow the patient to gather that information. But I have to tell you, again, I've been in a situation where that was challenged and we were actually ordered to turn over a record. The situation was actually related to something completely separate from the patient. There was a individual 
that uh, was a non-U.S. citizen who was driving while impaired, and the actual EMS unit actually rode by or, or passed by this individual being stopped. The attorney wanted to establish a timeline for the all the events that took place to try to get this individual out of the charges. In doing so, they actually subpoenaed the EMS record, which would serve as a record of exactly what time that call would have come in, and since it was near an EMS station, what time they would have passed by that individual because of, there were some discrepancies there. And it was actually a long, drawn-out ordeal that um, they actually wanted EMS to bring the record, uh, give them the record first, but then show up in court to testify related to it also. Even though it wasn't related to a patient or clinical care, it was a, something totally outside. Well, there's also this general statute 131E95, which talks about, and I've just pulled out part B here, but it talks about the Medical Review Committee and part of its actions and what should should happen. And one of the things it talks about is the non-discoverability and the what what public what is described as public records and what shouldn't be subject to discoverability or introduction into evidence of any civil action against hospital, ambulatory surgical facility, on and on and on. It also, further in Part B, discusses the context of individuals, saying that individuals that are involved in review of such cases shouldn't be subpoenaed to actually testify related to those cases in court. Now, part of that, one of the things that they mentioned in the text is actually giving out information and then taking all that information back up at the end of the day. But again, that goes completely against quality improvement methodologies and thought processes and and evidence base because the evidence base says that we should be given information as much as possible by the individuals so they know the level of performance so they can actually tweak their performance. How can we expect individuals to do something if they don't have information? Going back to the situation about um, the, the, the blood transfusion in the hospital, the individual receiving the wrong blood, in that situation, the idea was to only let the individuals know that and we started performing actual audits on blood transfusions and only let the individuals know that are involved that there's an issue. Well, again, it goes against Deming's principle completely. What we needed to do is actually give information back to everyone in the organization of the things that weren't happening appropriately. This is a big issue, too, with research. From a research perspective, if you take it on as research and you're trying to study whether some particular impact uh, or some particular change in process impacts outcome, the question becomes, do you just put it out there and expect the training to be all that's given to individuals, or do you give them performance feedback so that over time they actually do it better? In working with Instill and the folks from the Opals Project in, in Ottawa, Canada, uh, we actually spent some time talking about utilizing process improvement opportunities and error proofing concepts and things like statistical process control to feed information back to individuals on a monthly basis about what's happening such that performance was improved over time. So you can see there's still issues. If we do that, the question becomes, did the research project truly measure what it set out to measure to begin with? And is the data publishable because the information was actually put back out to individuals before the research trial was complete? So lots of issues, again, with quality versus research and this whole issue of medical review and who gets what information. So there's all these challenges related to the statutes. The important thing from your perspective is to realize, I think, that when we talk about quality improvement, I'm talking about something much larger, larger than clinical care. I'm talking about management of a system, improving everything you do, looking at processes and making improvements to those processes. One of the aspects that's key in EMS, of course, is clinical care. When it comes to the clinical care component, the organization needs to spend time talking about these issues and deciding up front 
a priori how they're actually going to handle these issues as opposed to waiting till some crisis exists and then trying to figure it out. Well, I'm going to stop there talking about legal issues and I want to change direction a little bit. I want us to talk about one other issue. I want us to talk about performance indicators. And here the key things I want to be able to cover with you are what are performance indicators and how to think about actually creating those for an organization related to some of the key processes. When we think about performance indicators, they're centered around this concept of key processes. And key processes are things in EMS that we have to do. We have to do because it affects the quality of care we provide or it provides the value of the care that we provide. Well, there's several models out there and some we've talked about before. Uh, we've talked about the Ballridge Award to some extent, but there's the NISTA, EMS agenda sections that talk about the agenda for the future. Um, there's also uh, Jack Stout some years ago actually came up with uh, published two articles that I'll post in the reading section about key issues or key performance areas in EMS. And those were really centered around public utility models, but even those talk about high level processes that are very important to organizations, regardless of what type of organization it is. And then finally, there's the open source EMS initiative that my partner actually initiated some years back. And in that, we actually work to get individuals to feed data in. The idea is, uh, like some of the software open source projects, is everyone would feed information in and over time consensus would be built around issues. Unfortunately, the open source project was put on hold because NITSTA decided to actually create a performance measures project itself to be based around and to be supportive of the National EMS Information System that we discussed in the previous lecture. So we'll talk about some of those things as we go through. If we think about the NITSTA, EMS Agenda for the Future, there were really 21 components. So one place to start would be to look at these 21 components as being key issues in any comprehensive EMS system. And as such, we would actually take and we could develop performance indicators for each of these individual issues. I mentioned Jack Stout and the key EMS process areas that he discussed. One was unit hour produ production. And with that, we're talking about things like employee recruitment and orientation, continuous quality improvement and training, fleet operations, materials management and make ready, scheduling compensation, labor relations, field operations, unit hour production management and supervision, and maximizing effective unit hours. There was also unit hour distribution which was another key process under which we'd look at things like service price and contracting, patient accounts management, and corporate management and administration. Well, in the open source, a lot of these things came together and you can see here the list that was derived based on kind of the combination of these two. And you can see that it more meets the, the more holistic nature or the more, um, I should say, um, political, governmental oriented view of a whole system than simply the operations of the EMS ambulance transport component that you saw in Stout's process areas earlier. But there are other lists. The accreditation processes have lists, both CAS accreditation for ambulance services, uh, the air medical industry accreditation process, ISO 9000, there's actually a version for EMS, as is there a, a Joint Commission accreditation version from Joint Commission International related to EMS. But many of these process areas are very, very high level. For instance, the Joint Commission doesn't publish the international standard in the United States. It only exists in Europe. And um, the reason they haven't is because there's not a political, or I should say an economical, um, um, push to actually do that. They don't see it generating more money for Joint Commission International and as such there's no reason to move down that line of accreditation when there's other accrediting bodies like CAS. So 
they don't want to create that that dilemma so they just simply don't publish it in the united states when we're thinking about performance indicators the most important thing is to think beyond these lists these lists are fine but they're the aggregates they're kind of the minimum they're the things that we might want to know in comparison to another organization but when we're thinking about performance indicators for the system we've got to think about it from the perspective of what processes are key for us to be in business or out of business and we can drill down from there to the key performance areas in those given processes so we want to start small um, and start with a willing process owner as we mentioned before in one of the six signal lectures the process owner is the person that's actually going to watch that process over time watch the output from that process and they're the ones that are going to determine when an intervention needs to take place we can actually work using the experience of others and this evidence base that exists in some of these areas to actually build performance indicators though that are more capable of being shared between organizations if that's a benefit that's really a benchmarking issue and we'll come back to talk about that later and we've discussed it some so far but you know the question becomes the process again the process is what we're interested in, interested in benchmarking not simply the number the number doesn't tell us a whole lot about what takes place so we don't really know what to choose it's the outcome measure what we're interested in is the process the proof of concept for any performance indicator though rests with the organization can you actually take it and utilize it to make changes and improvements in the organization that has to be the final litmus test is it worthwhile is it financially worth the time uh, is there value in creating and actually monitoring certain certain things you know and you can you can look at a lot of the things that are currently done in EMS and you can question those to some extent one key one is endotracheal innovation success um, you know as I travel around the country I ask individuals how many people you know in a class um, monitor endotracheal innovation success and the majority of people will raise their hand um, in a couple situations that hasn't been the case in particular I was teaching a class in Florida and there were two individuals in the class uh, from one system that didn't raise their hand and you know the second question I asked was well of all the people that are measuring it how many people have improved it so here's again the key distinction between quality assurance and quality improvement the people that w were doing quality assurance were measuring it spending a lot of time collecting data but did nothing to make it better people on the other hand looked at it from the perspective of what's the final outcome for the patient the final outcome is whether the airway was managed not whether the endotracheal tube was successfully placed or not so their measures were completely different they looked at pulse oximetry and capnography readings to tell if the patient was appropriately ventilated whether that was done with a bag simple O2 or uh, with an endotracheal tube whatever the case may be that was the measure from the customer's perspective that was the voice of the customer clinically so you can consider that and ask those things do you spend a lot of time collecting something and doing nothing with it now sometimes I realize we have to do that due to governmental regulations however from the governmental regulation perspective we should actually be lobbying to get rid of those type things that increase the cost of service and don't provide any evidence-based uh, support for what we do and there's actually quite a few of those things that that actually exist so to do that we ask you know who is the process customer what do they need or expect and how can meeting that need be measured then finally what data elements are needed to actually evaluate it and where can that data be obtained once we've got to that point where we know where the data is coming from what process can be used to get that data and then how can the data be validated to make sure that it's truly representative of what we think it's representing again it goes back to the measurement issue that we talked about in the last lecture or so where we talked about the precision and the accuracy of the data does the measure we all we know there's always variation in the measure 
does the measure actually tell us what's taking place with the process? And how should the measure be calculated? And then how should the results be disseminated and acted upon? Well, again, I think you know part of my biases to that is that we should really look at data that comes from a process as process data, which is very different than using historical uh, statistical approaches that you're often using when you conduct research in an organization. Well, here are some examples. If we think about process oriented, uh, we have fleet. From a customer perspective, we might have the crew. And then what do we need to know or expect? And it's reliability, how reliable the service might be. How can it be measured? We might break it down per 100,000 fleet miles. And the data elements that are needed would be the, the dates for each breakdown and the, fuel, the fleet mileage for some time interval or time frame that we would use to calculate that. We might obtain it from the CAD system or from the fleet office if those logs, depending on where those logs actually uh, reside, uh, whether they're electronic or not. And then when we think about what process can be used to get that data, we can actually ask the fleet manager to email it. We might get it through internet access or intranet access where we actually set up a reporting system. Or it could be that it's already in the database and we can simply download it. We could validate it by maybe, maybe comparing fleet and CAD logs. We've talked about this some before with measurement system analysis where we might actually use something like um, GPS measures of time of when a unit starts and stops to measure response time to actually calibrate, if you will, or to check the validity, the accuracy, the precision of the measure times that are recorded on reports or put in a database or show up on the CAD. How should it be measured? We can talk about the Excel formula for putting it in and then we may talk about how to disseminate it with a dashboard, internal reports, um, employee newsletters, through project teams, whatever the case might be. Well, we mentioned Don Abadian earlier in the course and we talked about the three aspects of structure, process, and outcome. So you might think about all three of those pieces when you're thinking about developing performance measures. We would like to know the outcome, but knowing the outcome without having an understanding of the steps that produce the outcome really doesn't leave us a lot of ability to actually take some action and change the output of the process. Also, the structure is important. Structure, though, is quite often not process measurement. Um, quite often when we talk at an aggregate level, at a state or a national level, people get really tied up about structure issues and demographics. Process measures are not structure issues. They're, they're not attributes per se. They're not demographics. Instead, they're what takes place from call to call to call or from day to day to day or week to week to week um, that produce some output. So they are very different. This was a, a key issue in terms of the NITSTA performance measures project because there was a, a complete lack of understanding about what performance or process indicators were and actually how those things would be measured. We can also look at process indicators as lagging, which are rear view uh, or looking back retrospective evaluations that, that talk about where we've been um, and often this is the case with financial measures. We look at financial performance of uh, the past, or we can talk about leading indicators, which is looking forward, which is you know what we're capable of doing and is predictive of future performance in structure, education, you know, employee satisfaction, whatever the process is we're looking at, but it tells us how we're going to do. So you might look at this and say, from a cardiac arrest survival perspective, a lagging indicator would be resuscitation performance or resuscitation rate, while a leading indicator would be something that would predict that. A leading indicator would be time to defibrillation, number of compressions, rate of ventilation, time to CPR, uh, response time, all of those things that are going to impact that output. So one's leading and one's lagging. When we think about performance indicator, we have to, again, think about monitoring and diagnostics. 
You know, how are we going to routinely monitor a process, how it's functioning? And then how are we going to drill down into actionable details? It's fine to have the monitoring system, but if there's not a way to drill down to the process level, then we still don't know, as I mentioned before, what to change. So we may know the overall response interval, but we need to be able to drill down to the point of saying crew notification to vehicle in route interval so that we know how long it took the crew to actually get out of the station, because that's something we could affect. We well, another way you can think, we can think about performance indicators and types is thinking about quality, cost, and value indicators. We briefly mentioned in the system design class this concept of the value equation, which um, I think Jack Stout talked about at some point uh, in some of his articles, but uh, I think it really arose from Joseph Duran, one of the quality-oriented gurus that we discussed early in the class. And basically it says that when we think about value, value is a product of the cost divided, excuse me, the quality divided by cost. So we can increase quality, but if we do that and it increase costs, we're really not doing anything to improve the value. What we would ultimately like to do is to either improve quality and keep the cost the same, or decrease the cost and provide the same level of quality. Both would increase the value that's actually provided. This is one of the reasons or the concepts that's utilized in like public utility models and private EMS contracts uh, with the thought being that we can provide the same level of service, but through a competitive process, we actually decrease cost. So if an organization can come in and provide the service for less money and provide the same level of, say, cardiac resuscitation rates, response time performance, and any other clinical indicators or operational indicators we might come up with, then it would make sense from a value proposition to actually engage in that contract. Well, I mentioned the MS Core Measures document, which is out there, that was the, the NITSTA project. I'll also try to put that in the links area of, of WebCat. But some of the things we came up with is things like aspirin administration rate, um, rate strip capture rate, 12 lead capture rate, um, acute coronary syndrome on scene time intervals, uh, pain relief. And some of these things may matter, matter and may some may not. Uh, there may not be clinical evidence that exists. Resuscitation, return of spontaneous circulation rate in the field and in the ED, survival rate overall to hospital admission rate and discharge, patient contact time to first defibrillation uh, is measured in a lot of organizations. And if you think back to the example that we talked about with data collection last time, in the initial rendition of um, the National EMS Information System, it was collected as less than five minutes, five to 10 minutes, and less than 10 minutes or greater than 10 minutes. Um, so you can see there was not a lot of degree of variability and it was very much made an attribute measurement as opposed to a continuous measurement of a specific time. As we discussed before, and you can see that's a perfect example of why you always would like continuous data as opposed to attribute data if you have the choice. Public access to fibrillation, application rate, and bystander CPR rate. Stratification factors could be included. We could look at pre presenting rhythm, comorbidities, all of these things is part of the resuscitation process. So you can see we can go deeper and deeper into the issue. But the key is to develop performance indicators that are at a high level that we can monitor on a weekly and base, weekly, monthly, and quarterly basis to see how we're doing. And then if we need to, we can utilize stratifying approaches to dig deeper into the data. From response interval, you can see there's many different response interval perspectives that we could evaluate. From a financial perspective, we could look at total EMS cost per capita, Medicare acceptance rate for first acceptance, for first submission, uh, total acceptance, on and on and on, average age of accounts receivables, dollars collected um, as a ratio of bills, a uh, build, claims collected um, based on number billed. From the fleet, we could look at cost per fleet mile, critical vehicle failures, rate, um, emergency vehicle contact rates. So there's lots of things we could look at. Now, in looking at these, it's important to think about how you would use the data. 
again, if we're going to try to put these performance indicators in the context of looking at them as a process over time, then we have to have a time series oriented perspective for looking at them. Well, there's very complicated ones and there's some that are much more simplistic. Something like a C chart that you see here that looks at percentages, you can see that the, the, the red lines at the top and bottom actually change based on volume. And in essence, what's that, what that is doing is actually adjusting for the opportunity space statistically from month to month or day to day, whatever the case may be. So, for example, if in a particular month you perform a large number of innovations in a system, it's easier to tell if you're different than, than the overall average of the system over time. However, if you only perform two innovations in a month, and you miss one, your rate's 50%. So it's very, so you can't say statistically that you're different than maybe the 85% rate you normally have simply because there's not the opportunities there to evaluate whether the process truly changed or not. So again, we're looking at it not from the numerical perspective, but from the process perspective. And we're asking the question, is the process different? Which is something we can act on. We simply can't act on the number without having knee-jerk reactions to the numbers and doing things that can, in essence, uh, be what Deming calls tampering, tampering with the process. We make minute changes in the process from time period to time period, time frame to time frame, and in doing such, we make the process worse instead of better. So we want to be careful about that. So here's the type chart you might see, for instance, for attribute data. Where we're looking at percentages. On the other hand, we may have continuous data. Uh, with the continuous data, there's multiple ways we could look at it. We could look at it again as a percentage of compliance, or the red lines would actually be straight and they weren't would not jump up and down if we looked at it in the context of um, continuous time. So I want to stop there. But that's performance indicators. They're very important to a system in figuring out where you're at and where you're actually going. In this lecture, we've spent some time looking at some of the legal issues related to quality assurance and quality improvement. We've also developed some of the, we've looked at the development of performance indicators and what should be considered in walking through and actually creating performance indicators that are actually valuable to your particular system.